1,000 years before the birth of Christ, they set out from the Orient to conquer the Seven Seas. They are shipbuilding geniuses, and their indomitable fleet knows no equal. They are traders with vast amounts of accumulated wealth, and their newly founded capital of Carthage rises in North Africa to become the most powerful city on the Mediterranean. The Phoenicians are the lords of the seas. Then a dangerous rival enters the arena. In the course of many wars, the Romans have ensured their domination over Italy. Now they are headed for Sicily and are threatening the colonies of Carthage. The Clash of the Titans. Mighty war fleets attack one another. The classical world is shaken to its foundations. The struggle continues for 48 years. The prize, world domination. Rome appears to have won, but Hannibal swears he will destroy Rome. The proud Carthaginian cannot bear the ignominy of defeat. He drives his apparently invincible army onwards to strike the Roman Empire at its heart. Neither raging torrents nor towering mountaintops can break his stride. His battle elephants cross the Alps and descend on Italy like fierce beasts, forcing the legions to turn tail and flee. The unimaginable happens. Hannibal stands before the gates of Rome. It appears the city is doomed. But the Romans don't give up, they fight back. Either they come out victorious, or their empire will fall. The despised fiend was shown no mercy. The legionaries let loose, pillaged and burned day and night, Hundreds of thousands were killed or driven into slavery. The battle elephants panicked and trampled their own masters. Carthage was left in ruins. In the year 146 BC, the historian Polybius visited the ruins of a city which had suffered destruction like no other before it. The senators in Rome had entrusted him with a difficult task. He was to solve the mystery how were the Phoenicians able to bring Rome to the brink of disaster? The Senate's emissary starts his investigation in the still smoldering ruins. Not long ago, this city was the command center of a great empire. This is where the plot to topple the Roman Empire was hatched. Rome now wants total power. Polybius must provide the consuls and generals with an answer to their urgent question, can Carthage rise again to instill fear and terror in the hearts of Romans? In the city's catacombs, the investigator discovers the sarcophagi of the Phoenician nobility. These people, when they were alive, were considered to be arrogant and unapproachable. Polybius had heard these rumors. They were said to be a grim people, despotic rulers, according to one Greek source. Every last record of what the Carthaginians wrote about themselves was destroyed. How could Polybius lift the veil of mystery shrouding these people? The home of the Phoenicians is far away, on the coast of Lebanon, in the ancient land of Canaan, the source of light. Their first temples appeared on this thin strip of Mediterranean coast. They are modeled after faraway places in Mesopotamia and Egypt. In front of the stone obelisks may have stood the altars dedicated to a god now unbeknownst to us. Archaeologists found these gilded bronze statues hidden away, sacrificial offerings. In the depths of the rock caverns, the tombs of the kings are concealed. Every new discovery here leads to a new mystery. Who does this enigmatic figure represent? A divine guardian for the journey into the afterworld? Treasures found in the tombs bear the seal of the Egyptian pharaoh Ramses. How did they get here from Egypt? The legendary rulers were laid to rest in massive stone sarcophagi. They are spoken of with disdain in the Bible. The prophets of the Old Testament accuse their Phoenician neighbors of immorality and a lust for grandeur. Rightly so? Does this relief depict a mourning woman or a scantily clad woman dancing in the burial chamber itself? How can the Roman investigator form an unbiased opinion of these people when all the reports are so one-sided? Or were the Phoenicians really such an evil, depraved people? 
They didn't make very many friends, but even their enemies couldn't resist being oddly fascinated by the Phoenicians' festival customs and temple rites. The renowned historian Herodotus claimed they had originally come from the Persian Gulf. Polybius had also heard rumors of this. Like the Hebrews, the Phoenicians were Semites and spoke a language related to Hebrew. Nomads, they once crossed the deserts of Arabia into the promised land on the Mediterranean coast. Their king, Achiram, was not one of the most powerful princes in the world, but he was one of the wealthiest. A magic formula is chiseled into the sarcophagus cover. The letters of a newly developed alphabet were used here for the first time. The alphabet will revolutionize writing in the Occident. This legacy of the Phoenicians is still used by us today. The inscription asks the god Baal to protect the deceased. Baal is a cruel god, according to the Bible, a murderous god. Only priests can behold his likeness. To believers, Baal and his divine companion Astarte embody the eternal laws of the cosmos, creation and death. Baal symbolizes the sun, the power to give life and the power to burn. Astarte symbolizes the moon, the mother of waxing and waning and of the passage of time. The king of Sidon has a temple built in their honor. Mysteries surround a massive stone throne. Is this where people danced around the golden calf, as described in the Bible? Did high priests celebrate a bloody form of idolatry in this inner sanctum? What took place in this temple 3,000 years ago? The stones remain silent. Not even the inscription on the sarcophagus of the temple's founder provides a clue as to what went on here. The Phoenicians have remained a mystery to this day. Almost no evidence has remained to tell us what court life was like in the palaces. The images and the few artworks which have been preserved are ambiguous. Are these priests celebrating a requiem for a deceased ruler? Or is this a living king receiving emissaries from Babylon or Egypt? A study of the sources in the ancient civilization on the Nile may provide us with an answer. For a long time, the realm of the pharaohs was the ruling power in the Near East, the protector of the city-states in Lebanon. Brisk trading set the tone for relations between the two lands. The Phoenicians were eager apprentices to their neighbors to the south and built shrines to the Egyptian gods. The temple districts in Egypt depended on certain raw materials from Lebanon. Especially the massive trunks of cedar wood were needed by the priests to build their colossal temple complexes. In ancient writings, the Phoenicians were referred to as Fenchu, meaning carpenter. The kings of Lebanon wanted to be buried in human-shaped sarcophagi, like the pharaohs, and magic spells and signs were used to protect them in the afterworld. For centuries, there was peace between Egypt and Lebanon. There was always enough cedar wood for the procession altars of the divine figures. Then suddenly, everything changed. Letters from the archives of the pharaoh Akhenaton show that the Phoenicians were trying to play off their powerful neighbors. But their plan failed. Lebanon became a war zone, just as it would 2,000 years later. In Beirut, destruction caused by the war gave archaeologists a unique opportunity. The buildings in the destroyed city center could not be salvaged, so the researchers moved in with their spades. Under the remains from the Turkish era, the scientists find building structures from the Byzantines, Romans and Greeks. Further down still, they seek the city of the Phoenicians. On Martyr's Square, they hit pay dirt. Underneath the destroyed asphalt, they found signs of 4,000-year-old streets and building foundations, explains the head archaeologist. Traces of the first Phoenicians. Layer by layer, the earth underneath Beirut is cleared away. Each new find could prove a sensation. Grave treasures, gold jewelry, or an important inscription which could provide a clue as to what sort of people lived here and what they called their city. Until now, we only know the Phoenician cities by the names given to them by the Greeks. The marine gastropod Murex lives in the waters off the Lebanese coast. 
It contains a dye which the classical rulers dreamed of, crimson. The Greek word phoiniches, the crimson dyers, gave the legendary seafarers their name. Die Welt hat immer die Menschen besonders bewundert, die als erste etwas unternahmen, entdeckten. The world has always been quick to idolize those who were the first to achieve or discover something. We still learn their names in school. The Phoenicians were just such a people. For a thousand years, these mighty traders influenced the destinies of the ancient world in the Mediterranean region. Phoenicians were particularly renowned for their shipbuilding skills. They used only top quality cedar wood. Their ships had to be fast and maneuverable. This is why they had such a slender, light frame. They were up to six times longer than they were wide. Their main weapon was located at the tip of the hull. The bronze ram was used to splinter the sides of enemy ships. These unique ships helped the Phoenicians achieve domination of the seas. Their harbors are located at the hub of ancient trade between East and West, between Africa, Asia and Europe. The city of Tyre rises to become the most splendid metropolis on the Mediterranean. A prophet writes that the city's merchants are like princes and its stores are the finest in the land. From Tyre they set off for the faraway land of Tarshish. In the Bible the returning ships are described laden with treasures. A worthwhile expedition. The great seafarers of Tyre are sent wherever riches may be found. The Phoenicians jealously guard the secret of the sea routes to the far west. Their destinations? Lands with vast mineral resources. Kution on Cyprus with its huge copper reserves. Asia Minor with its tin and iron ore. Raw materials in high demand everywhere for the production of tools and weaponry. With every war fought, the Phoenicians' wealth increases, even when they don't take part in a single battle. Boats still travel in sight of the protective coast, but the seafarers from the Orient dare to venture further and further. They trust in their navigational skills and in other people's thirst for new things. Polybius finds out from his renowned predecessor, Herodotus, that the Phoenicians set signal fires on the shore to lure the natives out onto the beach. There they have their wares laid out and ready in amphora like these. They trade their goods for gold and slaves. The sea traders from Tyre, Sidon and Byblos do excellent business. Greek noblewomen too anxiously await their luxury goods from the Orient. The Phoenicians provide the entire world with extravagant objects made from exotic materials. Thin-shelled ostrich eggs with a filigree finish are particularly in demand. Exquisite ivory artworks in the Egyptian style to decorate the king's apartments. Polybius studied the works of Homer the Greek. In his Odyssey, he describes an exquisitely designed bed covered with priceless ivory carvings, fit for a Greek royal couple. But Homer's description did not come from his own imagination. Archaeologists discovered just such a bed in the royal tombs of Salamis on Cyprus. This work of art can be seen today in the National Museum of Nicosia, crafted by Phoenician masters. A finely worked frieze with fantastic winged figures. It's in an international style, which is highly praised in its time and finds many a buyer. Even the pharaohs on the Nile become increasingly dependent on imports from Lebanon. Burial ceremonies are not possible without their fine cedar oil. The spiritual life of an entire people is threatened, because no afterlife is possible without embalming. At least, that's what the ancient Egyptians believed. Cedar wood is also indispensable for the construction of sarcophagi. When cedar wood supplies suddenly fail to appear, the entire death cult is endangered. To prevent impending disaster, a priest is sent on a mission. He is to go to Lebanon to ask for cedar wood and oil, a humiliating act for the powerful Egyptians. 
Although Egyptians and Greeks value the treasures they bring, they don't particularly like the Phoenicians themselves. In his writings, Homer curses the sea traders from the east, calling them lying scoundrels with ugly noses. He says that wherever their ships called, nothing was safe from these corrupt Orientals. Strong words. But these are most likely the great writer's expression of his countrymen's envy towards these well-versed strangers. Homer is certainly ungrateful, considering he too makes use of the new Phoenician alphabet to write his Greek texts. Despite their navigational skills, the Mediterranean Sea poses a constant threat to their frail wooden ships. That's why they only sail by day. On the North African coast, in what is now Tunisia, the Phoenicians found their first outpost, Utica. But it's her sister city which will achieve worldwide fame, Carthage. We don't know exactly when Carthage was founded. As legend has it, it was in the year 814 BC. At that time, Princess Elissa of Tyre is said to have fled to North Africa to escape her murderous brother Pygmalion, where she then founded Carthage. The historical reason for the founding is more likely an attack by the Assyrians on the Phoenicians' rich harbour towns in Lebanon. The Phoenicians were not a warring people. They preferred to conclude cooperative agreements, and when the going got tough, they then packed up and moved camp, in this case to Carthage. A sturdy fortress rises above the Tunisian coast. Phoenician builders fortified it strongly enough to serve its purpose for 2,000 years. Kekouan was an ancient drawing board city. To this day, its geometric layout can still be made up. It's protected by a sturdy ring of walls, Greek-style city planning. Cleverly, the Phoenicians adopted from others whatever they thought might be useful to them. Their advanced architecture can also be admired on the Sicilian island of Motya. The ancient harbour still exists today. Here, ships sought shelter from storms and unloaded on the quay aromatic oils and incense from Arabia, silk and spices from India, gold and ivory from Africa. The harbour took part in the international trade of exotic goods. Polybius studies with amazement the inventiveness with which the Carthaginians designed their former colonial cities. Even after its destruction, one can still see how well the place was protected against attack for centuries. Here, a heavy gate secured the entrance to Motya. Before the Romans, the Greeks were their greatest rivals, but as artists, they were nevertheless a welcome sight on the streets of Motya. This figure of a young man is still admired as a masterpiece today. The wealthy sea traders commissioned it from a Greek sculptor. But the particular manner in which the robe is folded proudly declares, this is a Phoenician. The foreign outpost did not content itself with its riches. Successful agricultural methods and technical innovations were introduced to Europe from the Orient. The salt works on the coast of Sicily also have their origin in this time. To this day, salt is reclaimed here. Long trade voyages would not have been possible without this preservative for fish and meat. A seafaring people needed salt. The network of Phoenician bases is more closely linked every year. The fleet has constantly expanded. Trade ventures become ever more ambitious. Far off to the west, they are lured by the legendary ore deposits of Tartessos. The Rio Tinto mine is the largest manually excavated hole in Spain. 3,000 years ago, the Phoenicians started to mine silver and copper here. They not only took the resources, they also left behind traces of their advanced civilization. These can still be found today on the island of Ibiza. Tucked away in a vast pine forest is a barely accessible cave. Here, the Phoenicians set up a shrine to their goddess, Tanit. And to this day, we can still sense the mystery of divine apparition when at high noon, beams of light suddenly penetrate into this underworld. We can only guess what sort of rituals were carried out in this dimly lit cave. 
In stone niches and sacrificial pits, researchers found small statues of gods and cult objects. Countless generations of believers made their pilgrimages here, continuing into modern times. On Ibiza, long after the destruction of Carthage, the Phoenician goddess continues to be worshipped and petitioned. But the citizens of Rome do not understand this kind of divinity with its contradictory persona. To the Carthaginians, Tanit was both mother goddess and hetaira. Rome's consecrated virgins would have blushed at such an idea. They served their gods through chastity. Tanit's priests, however, promoted prostitution in the temple and pocketed the wages of love. Not only in this remote religious cave is the island's Phoenician heritage evident. Ibiza is linked as if with an umbilical cord to the history of the Orient. Here too, extensive salt works give evidence of the ancient city. On the fortress mount, the ancient foundation walls have been built over, but the rock has been hollowed out to form ancient burial chambers. The name Ibiza is derived from Ivoshim. This is what the Carthaginians called our island when they settled here. The name means island of the god Bess and was used to refer to Ibiza and Formentera. Why was it named after the god Bess? Because there were no poisonous animals on Ibiza, no spiders, snakes or scorpions. This led the Phoenicians to believe that it was protected by the god Bess. <laughs> This singing has rung strange in the ears of many an ethnologist. It sounds like it's from another time and place. It's said to be Phoenician singing. These are reportedly the last two people to master this special singing technique used for traditional shepherd songs. Their death will mark the end of a long cultural heritage on this island, extending back as far as 2,500 years. The wedding jewelry of this farm girl has also been passed down through the generations. In Iberian princes' tombs, similar jewelry has been found, made by Phoenician craftsmen. The evidence becomes even more compelling following the excavation of an ancient oil press. The wild olive trees on the island were improved by the Phoenicians through grafting. Oil lamps and domesticated donkeys were also brought to Spain by the Phoenicians. Today, millstones are still used to press the oil, so precious in ancient times. The milling technique introduced then is still used today. In the ruins of the estate, this rough-hewn block of stone was found, a counterweight. Today's mills work along the same principles as thousands of years ago. The use of engines would speed up the pressing process, but the quality of the oil could not be improved. Ibiza's folk dances are also reminiscent of the faraway land of Canaan and Carthage. The female dancers circle ceaselessly around their male partners, like the moon around the sun. A symbolic temple round dance to honor the moon goddess Astarte and the sun god Baal, it said. Does this evidence allow us to draw an astonishing conclusion? Did the Phoenicians know that the planets revolved around the sun? Scientific evidence points to a close genetic link between Ibiza's farmers and today's Palestinians. This conclusion is the result of research done at the University of the Balearic Islands. It would no longer be misleading to speak of Phoenician blood coursing in the veins of the Ibethenkos. Legend even places the birthplace of the Carthaginian army general Hannibal right here on this outcropping on the Ibiza coast. The Vedra acted as a navigational landmark for Phoenicians sailing along the Iberian coast. Far off to the west, their travels took them to secret, unspoken destinations. Nobody was to know where the source of the Phoenicians' wealth lay. On the other side of the strait between Spain and Morocco lies the ocean. In 480 BC, Carthage blocks passage to all enemy ships. This is the starting point of the dangerous route to Britain, the home of tin, 
and to the fabulous islands in the ocean. The Phoenicians called today's Strait of Gibraltar the Pillars of Melkart. On both sides of the strait stood the temples to the god of the city of Tyre, a thorn in the side of all rivals. Polybius found confirmation of this in the Roman Senate's records. Rome's hatred towards Carthage began to develop at that time. But who cared about all that in Gades, today's Cadiz? The Phoenician city was flourishing. Worship of the gods determined everyday life. In Melkart's temple, a young priest is being initiated. The shrine was known in the old world for its beauty and wealth, as well as for its oracle. The ritual knife is being used to cut the young acolyte's hair, not his throat. He will use the knife himself later, during the sacrificial rites, when it's time to satisfy the god's thirst for blood. The chronicler Polybius had already heard reports in Rome about the religious rites of the Phoenicians. His countrymen are disgusted by these cult rituals. They consider them to be barbaric. In the Bible, too, they are harshly condemned. Blood is the most important sacrificial offering, but other parts of the body are also offered to the gods, even the hair of the newly initiated priest. In the temples of the goddesses Astarte and Tanit, priestesses practice holy prostitution. Herodotus writes that in Babylon and on Cyprus, all women must undergo this ritual at least once in their lives. Waiting in the goddess's shrine until a stranger comes to engage their services, leaving behind an appropriate payment in the temple's coffers. Eighty years after the fall of Troy, this is where the city of Cadiz in southern Spain is thought to have been founded by seafarers from Tyre. It lies well protected on an island in the most remote corner of the globe. This is how it's described by Roman historians. A clever settlement strategy because this meant that the Phoenicians now controlled both ends of the Mediterranean. Cadiz became the operation base for increasingly daring expeditions. 2,000 years later, Portuguese seafarers board their caravels in Lisbon. In 1497, Captain Vasco da Gama has decided it's time to discover a sea route to India. Da Gama has closely studied a papyrus text of Herodotus, who writes that Phoenicians sailed around Africa in the 7th century BC. The Portuguese want to repeat the feat. For the first time in 2,000 years, ships once again take to the seas on a course for the southern tip of Africa, the Cape of Good Hope. On their way down the Moroccan coast, the Portuguese establish highly fortified bases. Mogador is one of these. Since the end of French colonial rule, this harbour town has been known as Essa Uira, but the traces of the past are unmistakable. Heavy bronze cannons and fortress walls several meters thick were meant to keep the marauding Berber tribes in check. Mogador was a trading center and a military base. The Phoenicians preferred the natural defenses of an island. They established their settlement within sight of the coast. They were in Mogador for a particular reason, fishing. They followed the vast schools of tuna, which migrated regularly from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic. In Andalusia, fishermen still set out once a year in search of the prized tuna. They fish just as the Phoenicians did. The fish are lured into a large square of nets and surrounded. Then the boats draw closer and closer together. There's no escape for the tuna. But such large catches were a problem in the ancient world, especially for those in the warm south. How could they preserve the easily perishable meat so it could be transported to their customers far away? On the Atlantic coast, ancient fish factories have been discovered. The Phoenicians developed the method of preserving fish in large stone tanks and then processing it to make the delicacy known as garum to the Romans. 
a heavily salted fish puree, which, once it was filled into amphora, was transported as far afield as Persia and Germania. Around 500 BC, Hanno, a Phoenician seafarer, led a large fleet southwards from Morocco. Sixty ships with fifty oars each. This can be read by the chronicler in the preserved ship's log. It tells of eerie bushfires and wild ape men. Phoenicians apparently did not know the meaning of fear. They oriented themselves using the position of the sun and the stars. We don't know if they used instruments such as the sextant or compass, but like the Portuguese, they kept precise details of their sea routes and discoveries a secret. Hanno's voyage was a fantastic adventure which was met with astonishment and disbelief by his contemporaries. Past endless river deltas and violent volcanic eruptions, the ships pressed on to the south. The peoples of the ancient world considered the ocean to be the realm of sea monsters. But the Phoenicians knew better. Did they even discover America 2,000 years before Columbus? Between the two continents lies the archipelago of the Azores in the Atlantic. The remote island of Corvo is a steep volcanic cone with a deceptively peaceful looking crater. The sheer cliffs are said to have once borne a large statue with its arms stretched westward. This was reported by the first Portuguese sailors to discover the island. Ever since, Corvo has been combed for ancient temple remains. The search is concentrated on the narrow inhabited coastal strip. An English professor has found old pottery fragments here, of Carthaginian origin, he believes. In the harbour basin of Corvo, divers look for an ancient Astarta shrine which may have fallen into the sea during an earthquake, but they are hindered in their search by a hazardous undertow. In the waters off the coast of the island of Terceira, however, Portuguese marine archaeologists made a spectacular discovery. The Bay of Angra is a huge ship's graveyard with wrecks from many different periods. The difficulty confronted by divers here is determining how long ago the ship sank. But they are convinced this find is something special. The well-preserved wooden planks of this wreck appear to point to a more recent date. But appearances are deceiving. The sunken ship was buried for a long time under a layer of sand several meters thick. Its presence was only revealed by a severe storm. The divers are under pressure because a new storm is brewing. It's worth all the effort. The design of the ship indicates that it's very old indeed. A find from the Phoenician era would be a sensation. The long sought proof of the legendary voyages of the Carthaginian seafarers described in ancient writings. In 1749, a fisherman discovered strange coins on the shore of the island of Corvo. At the Portuguese king's court, experts identified them as being Carthaginian pieces of silver from the 3rd century BC. But the treasure was inexplicably lost in Spain. Was this evidence intentionally destroyed to ensure that Spain's claim to the discovery of America would not be contested? Carthage constantly expanded its network of trading posts. Along the Atlantic, it extended from West Africa to the British Isles. The Carthaginians learned from the changed circumstances throughout the Mediterranean. They quickly realized that domination of the seas alone, supported by a number of trading bases, was not enough. Colonies were needed. They had to be present on a military level and be able to show their strength. They didn't want to be a city of shopkeepers. This was a fateful decision. The Carthaginians felt strong. They conquered the cities and temples of their enemies on Sicily and set up their own altars. Soon the Greeks and Romans began to entertain a dreadful suspicion. What was going on in the Phoenician centers of cult worship? A temple ruin still leaves archaeologists puzzled. In the center of the shrine, a massive sacrificial stone with a blood basin and grooves for draining. A nearby mosaic shows a lion and a bull. 
Was the blood of animals shed here? Or does this stone indicate a much more dreadful practice? The Bible gave the Phoenician's temple graveyards a name, Tophet. In Carthage, thousands of narrow stone sarcophagi harbor the bones of children. They did not die of natural causes. The children were murdered. The Roman senator's emissary is to discover the whole truth. Rome's citizens are incensed when initial reports of the bloody practices of the Carthaginians begin to reach them from across the sea. The shock lies deep. But is there proof? In the Tophet, there's a collection of apparently insignificant memorial stones. Phallic symbols indicate a fertility cult. Everything here remains a mystery. Barely recognizable figures are chiseled into the stone, their meaning unknown to today's observer. An opening in the masonry leads to an old vault. In the dim light, stone monuments overgrown with moss can be made out. On the floor, black stains are reminiscent of cold fire pits marked by the remains of ashes. On the walls, small altars were set up with incense and food offerings for gods unknown to us today. The priests' holy books could shed some light on this question, but they have been lost. Not a single original chronicle of Carthage has been preserved. Only a few Greek copies remain. They reveal little of the people's relationship with their gods. Even the deciphered dedications on the memorial stones merely give the name of the donor. Some of the altars appear to be dedicated to the goddess Tanit. The relief carved into the surface displays her symbol, a silhouette with its arms crossed over its chest. A goddess who is petitioned when worries become overwhelming, when it's a matter of life and death. But her priests also demand life be sacrificed. The beguiling Tanit supplanted Astarte on the divine throne in Carthage. The rising city stresses independence in culture and religion as well. Like a predecessor, Tanit appears in seductive dress. What's the meaning of Tanit's presence in this cursed place? Another stele in the Tophet gives more precise information. A man, his typical headdress identifying him as a priest, carries a small child. It would appear to be a harmless scene if it weren't known that this is how the priests present the sacrifices to the divinity. For researchers, this is clear proof that children were sacrificed here. This makes an eyewitness account more credible to Polybius. The cruel ritual denounced in the Bible continued to be practiced in Carthage. A statue of the god receives the child sacrifice. The Bible gave it a name too, Moloch. It's the sons of leading citizens who have to be brought before the eerie bronze statue. But these noble families try to get around this annoying decree. They secretly buy children for the sole purpose of sacrificing them when the occasion arises. But this deception is discovered and superstitious fear spreads when an enemy army besieges the city. The Carthaginians believe they have insulted the honor of the gods and are now left without protection against the enemy's attacks. To make amends, they select 200 children from the city's noblest families and sacrifice them in public. Others who believe they've been chosen sacrifice themselves willingly, and the total is no less than 300. This is what has been written. Human sacrifices have been proven throughout early history, and even in the classical world, they were carried out time and again in extreme situations. The people provide the gods with gifts and expect supernatural help in return. The highest price a person can pay is the life of his own children. The Moloch figure is equipped with a movable mechanism which is invisible to those watching. When the high priest pulls a hidden rope, the arms open and the dead child falls into the flames. The roar of the flutes and drums serves to drown out the wails of mourning, according to one eyewitness. It was considered to be dishonorable for the mothers of the sacrificed children to break out in tears. It was also reported that on Sardinia, the Phoenicians not only burned the most beautiful prisoners, they also disposed of all old people in this manner. Even Moses was warned by the Hebrew god about the Phoenicians' rites. 
Tell the sons of Israel that anyone who gives any of his offspring to Moloch is to be immediately put to death. Today, the terrible place is practically unidentifiable. The Roman troops looted and razed the temples and palaces. Never again would war rise to threaten them from this place. Nothing was left of the priests' temple rites. Their proud countenance was ground into the dust. When the historian combs the rubble for buried traces of the past, he finds almost nothing. A carafe of perfumed water, a small oil lamp, all valuables have been removed. Carthage's name is to disappear from the annals of history. No trace is to be left of the city, and even Polybius is ordered by Rome to provide a false report to diminish the memory of the Phoenicians. For 1,000 years, these powerful traders influenced the fate of the classical world around the Mediterranean. To Rome, they represented a dangerous opponent who had to be eliminated. Even considering it today, it appeared the Romans were left with no other alternative. The ground is still littered with stone projectiles hurled over the walls by massive catapults. The noise of battle had long since died away by the time the Roman emissary arrives. Only the stones remain. The city counted half a million inhabitants. Goods arrived here from all over the world. Some even said that the Phoenicians had invented trade. But Polybius was witness to a fundamental change in the classical world. Since then, Carthage's wealth has been nothing but a legend. Before the Great War, it was a land of flourishing gardens and fertile fruit plantations. Rivers and canals irrigated every corner. Battle elephants augmented the huge army of mercenaries from many different lands. Everything converged on the capital of the Carthaginian Empire, increasing its prosperity. The nobility succumbed to life's pleasures on their estates. The rest of the land struggled under heavy tax burdens, but all that wealth was squandered on the battlefields. In his report, Polybius wrote of the mistakes made by Carthage. But can Rome learn from its enemy's fate? Or is the fall of the Roman Empire already within sight? The quarries of El Hawariya. Carthage was built from this rock. Thousands broke pieces from the stone and sawed them into manageable blocks. The Phoenician settlers' new city grew larger and larger. More and more stones and pillars were needed. The hollows in the rock were dug deeper and deeper. On this ceiling, we can still make out traces of the chisels wielded by many generations of stonemasons. Were they respected craftsmen, or were they slaves like those in the Roman quarries, used and abused, just bags of bones sacrificed in the name of Carthage's greatness and fame? The harbours also bear witness to the Phoenician builder's genius. Ships from all over the world lay at anchor in the square commercial port. Their captains doubled as spies. The circular naval port was hidden behind large gates and a double wall. In the middle was the Admiralty, which guarded storehouses and docks for 220 warships. The Carthaginians' mastery of the seas lent them a strategic mobility unmatched by any of their rivals. At first, nobody dared engage in military conflict with Carthage outside of their own territory. They wouldn't have had much luck if they had. The Carthaginians, with the immense wealth they'd accumulated through trade, were able to finance a large army of mercenaries in addition to their own fleet. Their sights were now set on capturing the breadbasket of Sicily. The Phoenicians' armada is the strongest in the Mediterranean, without a doubt. But their up-and-coming rivals, the Romans, are building up their army and fleet of warships. Carthage sends its entire fleet to the coast of Sicily, but the fortunes of war do not smile down on them this time. Roman troops besiege the Phoenician colonies. The powerful tyrant of Syracuse has gone over to the enemy side. It looks as though Sicily will be lost. Rome gains the upper hand. In 241 BC, two mighty fleets meet off the coast of Sicily. 120 ships carrying at least 30,000 men lurk off the coast. The tension is unbearable. After years of practice, it's time for the crew to show what they can do. One false movement of the rudder could spell defeat. As usual, the Phoenicians tried to maneuver between the enemy ships and ran them from behind. 
But the Romans have developed new boarding bridges and turned the ocean into a battlefield for their ground troops. Rome triumphs. Carthage is forced to abandon Sicily and loses its entire fleet. 33 years later, when Hannibal declares war once again, the Romans don't take him seriously at first. He intends to use a special troop of 37 Indian battle elephants to ensure victory. Hannibal's family has built up a colonial empire in Spain and used the substantial profits to recruit an army of mercenaries. The mighty force heads east through southern France. The ascent into the mountains claims countless victims, but Hannibal presses on relentlessly. The Romans feel safe behind the natural shield of the Alps, but the brilliant commander achieves the impossible. He overwhelms the Roman troops in northern Italy and marches on towards Rome. It's the year 217 BC. A shaken Polybius describes the defeat of the legions at the Lake of Perugia. Most of them plunged into the water with only their heads remaining visible. When the horsemen appeared and it was clear they would be defeated, they cried out for mercy and ultimately met their deaths at the hands of the enemy. Rome digs in behind its fortifications. Alarming rumors spread. Hannibal enjoys victory after victory, but does not attack the city of Rome directly. After 10 years, the battle is lost. Carthage refuses to provide Hannibal with fresh supplies. He flees into exile and commits suicide. Carthage survives, but has not a moment of relief. An unexpected new threat appears on the horizon. The African hinterland had never been of much interest to the Phoenicians. Only nomads could survive there. Carthage had always looked down upon these barbarians. Now they are forced to pay for this arrogance. The mounted warriors of the African king Masinissa sweep down from the desert and surrounding mountains. They successfully storm the city to prepare the way for the Roman legions. Carthage is unable to defend itself against the hatred of the suppressed peoples of the desert. Carthage lets others do its fighting. The empire's wealth protected normal citizens from military service. Their armies were made up of mercenaries. But when the coffers ran dry, the foreign soldiers turned into bitter enemies. The mercenaries rebelled, and this further weakened the city. Carthage had to fight three wars against Rome, extending over 48 years. It lost its fleet in the first war, its European colonies in the second, and ceased to exist as a result of the third. Why did Rome come out victorious? Carthage deliberated, Carthage pursued its own interests and sometimes undertook quite risky gambles. Rome, on the other hand, single-mindedly pursued its policy of consolidating power. Rome had one idea, a military state in which each and every citizen must fulfill his duties. Even when they were threatened with defeat, Rome never gave up and didn't give in either. And if Rome negotiated, it was only as the victor. Carthage wanted the profits from the global trade of the age. Rome wanted sole power in an ever-increasing empire. For Rome, this triumph signaled the start of a new era. Military leaders gained more influence. The power of the public assemblies was continuously restricted, and soon a godlike emperor took his place at the top of the increasingly mighty Roman Empire. Polybius will file an honest report. Rome enjoyed total victory. For Carthage, the defeat was absolute. The once inexhaustible storehouses fell into disrepair. After the defeat, this region was merely on the edge of another empire, and its riches filled the larders of Rome, the new hub of the universe. The nobility's comfortable lives on their estates were a thing of the past. The hordes of priestesses no longer populated the temples of Tarnit. Instead, they filled the brothels in the harbour town of Ostia. The Romans practically gave away the contents of Carthage's libraries and archives to the barbarians. The chronicler sees many heads rolling, including those of the ancient eastern gods. The Roman pantheon of gods has not yet replaced them, but they rapidly fade from people's memories. Tanit also falls into oblivion. She is replaced by the Roman goddess Venus. Her cult doesn't take bloody sacrifices. Carthage's altars are destroyed and the occupiers rule with a firm hand. 
the Carthaginian holdings become the Roman province of Africa. Only years later does Rome lift the ban and establish new cities on the ruins. Many of the cleverly devised irrigation systems fall into disrepair, the once fertile land dries up. The surviving mercenaries have returned to their faraway homes. Trade caravans, once richly laden with exotic goods, are a thing of the past. There are almost no populated Phoenician settlements left. Even the people who were spared by the enemy have moved away. Hesitantly, nomads occupy the deserted dwellings. But the more superstitious fear the structures, which are thought to have been cursed. The desert advances further and further. Nobody is left to stand in its way. A great civilization is swallowed up by the shifting sand dunes. Rome is on the rise and writes world history on its own from this point. Its citizens had a high price to pay for this. 50,000 died in the Battle of Cannae alone. Carthage tried to deceive fate with the blood of children, but the city was forsaken by its gods and doomed to defeat. In the year 146 BC, the history of the Phoenicians ends. Thank you.